Good morning, Potter 10. And a happy Mother's Day to all our moms out there. Whether you're a mom to a little one, um, one of our middle schoolers or high schoolers, or whether your kids are my age, um, <laughs> we just celebrate you today. You play the role of organizer, nurturer, family psychologist, comforter, personal chef, cheerleader, problem solver, chauffeur, and always sympathetic ear, mostly for us dads when we complain about all we have to do. <laughs> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, love does not boast, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. That's a mom right there. Moms understand love. Well done, good and faithful servants. Can we get up, give it up once again for all the moms out there? All right, let's pray before we go to the Word. <clears throat> Father God, that, may that last song be our prayer this morning. We will make room for you, for your Holy Spirit, to do whatever you want to. We make this day about you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So by a show of hands... How many people who have ever heard of Lloyd's of London? Okay, okay, a few of you. In case you're not familiar with Lloyd's of London, they're a British insurance market where members operate as syndicates, more specifically as investment bankers and brokers, to insure or diversify risks of, of different businesses, organizations, or individuals. Over the years, they've made a name for themselves, providing insurance for some very strange and outlandish things, uh, and people. <laughs> so here's just a look at a few. Who recognizes these guys? Anybody? What is it? Abbott and Costello, exactly. Um, in their legendary Who's On First routine, Lloyd's of London insured Abbott and Costello's routine for $250,000 on a five-year term if for whatever case, for whatever reason, they were unable to perform with each other. Lloyd's of London also insured <laughs> Keith Richards. Hands for $1.6 million in case his guitar playing abilities ever left him. Now, two quick thoughts on this. Number one, um, it must have been a pretty old policy because his current worth is somewhere around $500 million, so it must, must be kind of old. And second, I think if I was Keith, I probably would have insured my insides if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, last crazy example um, of things Lloyd's in London assured, and Dave Matthews wrote a great song about it, Satellite. Some of you got that joke. <laughs> You think it would be hard to get a policy on something that's literally shot into orbit and left unprotected in space for prolonged periods of time. But that didn't stop Lloyds from being the first to insure satellites, starting with Intelstat 1 in the 1970s. Lloyds underwrites, uh, Lloyds underwrites satellite policies at $100 million each, and they're serious about it. In fact, in 1984, the company put up financing um, for a space shuttle mission and a crew of five astronauts to go recover two rogue, rogue satellites. But Lloyd's isn't just about ensuring strange and unusual things and people. <laughs> Back in 1958, they did a study on paper clips. Dave, do, do, we have a, do we have a picture of a paper clip somewhere? Oh, no. Oh, no. No. I thought Clippy died off after Windows XP. And he always popped up at the worst time, didn't he? Oh, <laughs> It looks like you're writing a term paper. Would you like help? You impatiently click no. No? Are you sure? It's due tomorrow. You really should have started this sooner, but that's fine. Just ignore me. I mean, you have such a solid track record of making good decisions. <laughs> Dave, do we, do we have a picture of any real paper clip? Okay, good. Thank you. There we go. So in 1958, um, Lloyd's Bank of London commissioned a study to find out what happened to a typical batch of paper clips as they were released throughout the workforce. Not sure really how they accomplished that, but the findings of the study were rather intriguing. Of the 100,000 paper clips they tracked, they discovered that 3,916 were used to unplug tobacco pipes. I guess that's the universal symbol for unclogging a unclog tobacco pipe. 5,308 were used to clean under fingernails. Oh, it gets better. 5,423 were used to pick teeth or scratch ears. Yum. 7,200 were, were used as hooks for belts, suspenders, or various other garments needing, other, needing fastening. 14,163 were snapped, broken, or otherwise twisted during phone conversations. 
And approximately 25,000 were simply lost, swept off the floor, or otherwise discarded. What they found in the study was only about 20,000 of the 100,000 paper clips, a mere 20% were ever actually used to fulfill the purpose for which they were designed. Another way to put it, each one was designed for and created for a specific purpose, but the overwhelming majority were still used to fill some other ancillary purpose. Still the most telling statistic about this study is that a fourth of the paper clips, 25 plus percent, were simply swept away and unaccounted for, never having the opportunity to live out, if you will, the purpose for which they were designed. But what about us? Do we live out the purpose for which we were designed? Do we got purpose? It's a phrase we hear casually tossed around quite a bit, purpose. We also hear that phrase, calling, thrown around, don't we? And the two are often used interchangeably. And while I'm not going to focus on calling today, I do want to draw a clear distinction between calling and purpose. So here's the best thing I'd come up with. Calling is a personal invitation from the Holy Spirit for us to participate in the furthering of God's purpose. Okay, what do you think? That pretty close? Makes sense? See, our calling is likely to change, shift, and evolve over the course of our lives, but his purpose to which we are called remains constant. Again, there are a number of ways we can describe the relationship between the two, but that should at least get us going in the right direction. So now, with that high-level overview of purpose and, um, from a Christian perspective, let's take a look at how the world defines purpose. And there's usually one of two schools of thought. This first one is actually pretty thoughtful. I saw a great visual of this um, back at a conference a few years ago. You, you may have seen a, vi a version of this before, um, but we're going to build this from the ground up. So we're going to start with a single circle, and then we're going to call this circle what you love. And then we'll add another circle, and we'll call this what you're good at. Then where those two overlap is your passion. Then we add another circle and call this one what the world needs. In the overlap of what you love and what the world needs is where we see our mission. Add one more circle, which creates two distinct overlaps, and we call that circle what someone will pay for. When that overlaps with what you're good at, we find our profession. And where some, well, what someone will pay for overlaps with what the world needs, we have vocation. And in the very middle, where everything kind of comes together, we find our purpose. This is an ikigai diagram. And actually, I was stunned. I actually showed this in our apologetic series to our youth. And I think it was Robbie Eisberg. I actually knew what this, was, this was. I showed this. I thought, oh, this is so clever. They're going to love this. Like, nah, I know what this is. Your kids are smart, y'all. Um, but yeah, this is an ikigai diagram. It's a Japanese concept that means reason for being or reason for life. According to this idea, your ikigai is your life purpose or bliss. It's what brings you joy. It's what inspires you. What gets you out of bed in the morning. Overall, not a bad concept, but it's missing one key component. Can anybody spot it? God. God is nowhere in this ikigai diagram. And so while it's not overly bad, he's just nowhere to be found. It's a completely human-centric construct. Can I just say that trying to find purpose without God is like getting hair care tips from me? It just doesn't make sense. So that's one worldly view of what purpose means. The other is a bit more troubling, and that is simply that life has no purpose. This is actually a headline from an article I found from back in October um, uh, 20, 2021. And the synopsis of the article reads, Life is purposeless. Don't be shocked. The whole idea of purpose is wrong. It's out of greed. Life is sheer joy, a playfulness, a fun, a laughter, to no purpose at all. Life is its own end. It has no other end. The moment you understand it, you have understood what meditation is all about. I feel so much more enlightened knowing that. Does anyone else's heart break reading that? I mean, that is seriously what a lot of the world thinks. 
It's heartbreaking because just like the Ikigai diagram, God is completely left out. And when God is left out, it allows someone else to make their way in and push their purpose. Now, who could that be? I don't know. Yes, it could be Satan. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Had to lighten things up a little bit. (laughs) Now, let's unpack purpose. And we're going to start off with actually some great news. So if you're taking notes, the first truth this morning is you were designed for his purpose. And I can't think of anywhere in Scripture um, where this is more definitive than Ephesians 2.10, or Ephesians 2.10, where Paul declares in no uncertain terms, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I get chills every time I read that verse and I come across that word workmanship. Your translation may say masterpiece. The Greek word used here is poema, which means that which has been made, a work of the works of God as creator. And Matt's mentioned this before. It's where we get the word poem. A beautifully, thoughtfully, and intentionally crafted masterpiece. That's you. That's you. That's you. And let me be clear. You are not just a collection of cells that came into existence by some cosmic happenstance. You are not the result of God practicing a new hobby to pass the time. You are his masterpiece. You are made in the image of Almighty God. Same word poema is used in Romans 1.20 where Paul writes, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Sit in that for just a second. The sheer fact that you are mentioned in the same context as the very earth he created for his purpose is all the proof you need that you also are created for his purpose. But even with proof, we're still stubborn, are we not? Our doubt often manifests as rationalizing why we're not worthy of being called to his purpose. I've done this, I've done that. If you only knew my story, I'm just not worthy. Guess what? You're not. (laughs) And neither am I. It's a great equalizer, isn't it? We've already looked at Ephesians 2.10, but look what comes right before that in Ephesians 2.8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We are not saved by our good works. We're saved for his good works. God has a purpose for giving you that gift. So what are we to do with it? This brings me to one of my passages, maybe my favorite passage in all of Scripture. It's not actually gone over all that often. Uh, It's Philippians 2, 12 through 15. And I love it because Paul articulates a very clear calling and purpose in just two short verses. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. (laughs) Paul covers a lot of ground in four short verses here. Um, So let's unpack it, starting in verse 12 with work out your salvation. It does not mean work for your salvation. We've already touched on that. It's a gift. Working out your salvation means that there should be evidence of your salvation in your life. Fruits of the Spirit, just doing life differently than the rest of the world. If the world doesn't see us willing and working for his good pleasure without grumbling and disputing, yeah, I know that's my downfall too. If the world can't see Jesus for who he truly is in us, an unbelieving world is simply going to say, why bother? If we don't conduct ourselves as the blameless and innocent children of God, Without blemish, we will not shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Some translations say crooked and perverse generation. And is there evidence that we're living in a crooked and perverse generation? Sure there is. But it's nothing new. We're we're not special. (laughs) Look back at things in Jesus' day or go back to the Old Testament. There's always been messed up people and practices. And we can't just arbitrarily say, and this is current time now, we can't just say, oh, it's those Gen Zers that are the problem. 
No, it's not the millennials either, or my Gen Y crowd, or the Gen Xers before us. I mean, go back to the 50s and 60s. People thought Elvis's dancing was downright scandalous. Obviously evidence of a crooked and perverse generation, right? Come on. Nowadays, Jason and Elliot could do a little jig up here with some wild guitar playing, maybe even get the little Elvis lip curl going, go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And we probably wouldn't think too much about it. Might be thinking, oh, wow, they're really filled with the spirit today. <laughs> Y'all, there's always somebody we can point a finger at. But here's a point, here's a problem. When you point a finger at somebody, there's three more pointing right back at you. Wow, I just spit. It's like being at SeaWorld. Um, <laughs> Don't be in the first four rows. Splash zone. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's problems. There's things to blame. There's things we can do too. So why don't we lead with grace? Why don't we lead with love? Jesus did. People noticed that. Second truth this morning. Our present does not invalidate his purpose. Some of you really need to hear this today. And believe me, I get it. Life happens. Life is hard. We've all been there. So just by a show of hands, how many of you have questioned God's purpose in the middle of your circumstances? Okay, maybe a dozen honest people. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm right there with you. But if that's you here this morning, let this next verse just wash over you. Let this be what you put on today as your truth armor. That's Philippians 1.6, and with this one, I I just love how the Amplified Version says this. And we don't really go to the Amplified Version very often. Philippians 1.6 says, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. Don't give up. God's got this. There's proof of this in the very attributes of God, his very character, I just want to go over the quick names of God in case people need a reminder of who it is that we serve, who it is that's on our side. Jehovah Ra, the Lord is our shepherd. Trust him and his purpose. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord will heal the physical, the emotional, the spiritual. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I wish I understood this one a few years back when, or not a few years, quite a while now, when, Re- when Rebecca and I were first married. I mean, I'm telling you, there were a few years when we started out, we were so broke, our cash bounced. <laughs> he is faithful. He will provide. You're going to make it. Next one, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Y'all, the world needs some of this right now. Can I get an amen? Next one. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord is our righteousness. God himself stands for us and provides us with his righteousness and his justice when we don't have any ourselves. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is always present. If you need to hear this, he sees you, he knows you, he knows your pain, he knows what you're going for, and he has a purpose for you. Last one, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Nisi means flag or banner. So together, Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is my banner. God himself is our banner. He is our victory. He goes before us, and he is the one who wins our battles. Don't tell God how big your problems are. You tell your problems how big your God is. Who we are doesn't matter when we know whose we are. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may be proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Fellow chosen ones, adopted children of the Almighty God, never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Third truth this morning, pride points away from his purpose. <laughs> and that's something we're all guilty of. For this one, I'm going to start with a short story that happened just a couple weeks ago. And let's, let this be a warning to watch what you do in public because it could end up as a sermon illustration. So Rebecca and I were at the gym. <laughs> I noticed these three teenagers lifting their shirts and snapping pictures in the mirror of their washboard abs, presumably posting on their favorite social media platform. Did anybody else know this was a thing? I, maybe, I just, maybe that's not cool. One of the kids was very clever and put his shirt in his mouth so I'm, I'm presuming to get a perfectly stable, crystal clear picture 
of this. And I couldn't help but laugh, especially when I thought, just for a second, what you would think. What if I did the same thing? <laughs> Y'all, if I had done that, the world would have seen another exodus, this time at the Cary YMCA. <laughs> oh, hey, all of a sudden, where did everyone go? Oh, hey, the bench press is open. <laughs> that story makes me chuckle for two reasons. One, the only thing different from me and this kid is that when I, when I was younger, working out daily, we didn't have camera phones. I probably would have done the same thing, if I'm honest. <laughs> and second, <laughs> we all have our prideful thing. This poor kid and his friends, they're just a little more visible. Remember the finger pointing analogy? Ooh, I don't like that ratio quite as much. But pride's been around for a while. It's why Lucifer was cast out of heaven. And then he turns around and tempts Eve with the same kind of prideful desire to be like God. Pretty clever, I have to admit. If one believes they are like God, have the knowledge of God, they can be deceived into believing they just don't need God. In fact, Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus calls out um, seven specific churches located in what's now modern-day Turkey. And for six of these seven churches, Jesus offers both praises and criticism. That's fair, I guess. For one church, however, you notice I said only six of seven, Jesus didn't call out a single thing they did well. The church of Laodicea, it's actually the one uh, furthest down there near the river. And let's just take a look at what it says. It's just, it's just so telling. So Revelation uh, 3.14 is where we're going to start off. Right to the angel of the church in Laodicea says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You see, the church of Laodicea had grown complacent. Its self-sufficiency and search for wealth made it lose its love, faithfulness, and direct relationship with Jesus. They lost their purpose. Wealth and self-sufficiency became their purpose. But what about us? Are we distracted from him? Do we focus more on the matters of this world or the matters of the kingdom? Maybe a better question is, do we spend more time promoting ourselves or promoting him? Y'all, I'm just going to say it. The world does not need more political talking heads, Instagram influencers, TikTok videos, your washboard abs. The, wor the world does not need to be pointed to us. The world needs to be pointed to him. And that is the one, and that is our purpose, to introduce a sick and dying world to the only one who saves. Pastor Rick Warren puts it this way, you weren't put on earth to be remembered, you were put on here to prepare for eternity. Maybe take some people with you. It's not going to happen looking at your washboard abs. Just going just to put that out there. Last point I want to make, and I'll keep this short and simple, just like me. <laughs> we must persistently seek his purpose. We live in a world that rejects absolute truth. And if you're a Christian, I'm just going to tell you, you've got a target on your back. The world screams, you can't tell me what truth is but I'll tell you how to feel. And you better like it. You don't want to be canceled, do you? We live in a time where ever-evolving subjective half-truths are the norm and real truth is seen as a threat. Why? Why is the world scared with truth? Ever wondered that? I suspect the underlying apprehension is this. Real truth doesn't revolve around me. It might cost me something. I might not get everything I want. And that just doesn't make me happy. Show me anywhere in this book where it says God's purpose is to make you happy. It's not in there. I've looked. A lot, actually. So how do we know his purpose? It's simple, really. By persistently and consistently being in the word. If we're not in his word, how can we know his word? Maybe I should ask it this way. If we don't know the truth, how can we spot a lie? 
Jesus explains it so simply in John 15 when he says, Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. May we remember that today. So, in closing, I'm going to close with a little bit of Jewish history here. Um, and the youth can tell you I'm, I'm a nerd for, for a good history lesson. So, back in Jesus' day, and for generations before that, uh, Jewish um, parents and grandparents would recite Torah over their children and grandchildren. Um, this was done so that it was not uncommon. This, is, this was so common that um, by the age of five... Um, or that, sorry, this was done so that it was not uncommon for a baby's first words to come from Scripture. At age five, Jewish children um, went to Bet Safer, kind of what we would picture as elementary school. They learned foundational Torah teachings. Um, they learned how to memorize the Torah. They learned how to write, read, all we know. Uh, most children actually memorized the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, by age 10. At around age 10, girls started working alongside their mothers, and most boys learned their father's trade. Some promising and prominent boys were allowed to further their education at Bet Talmud, which is the house of learning, or Bet Midrash, the house of study. Kind of a combination of high school and college. There they mastered Jewish law, oral traditions, and rabbinic interpretations. At around age 15, most boys completed their education. Most returned home to work in their father's trade, but an elite few advanced the next level in education. The uniquely gifted would seek out a rabbi to study under, often leaving their homes to devote their lives to the learning from this master and becoming like him. And this student was known as a Talmud, and collectively they were known as the rabbi's Talmudin. Someone who longed to know what his rabbi knew and wanted to become what his master had become. Outsiders observing the Talmud would offer blessing as they walked by. May you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. The idea being that students would follow their rabbi so closely that the dust kicked up from the rabbi's feet as he walked would literally cover them. But to do that, they had to follow him very closely. While learning, the, the rabbi evaluated and scrutinized the students to see if he had what it took. And if they did the rabbi would eventually say, come follow me. In Hebrew, it's lahacharai. And among, the, among that, uh, with, with that invitation, the student would then devote the next 15 years of their life to learning the way of the rabbi, how they did life, to bear their, to bear their rabbi's yoke themselves. Y'all, this is why it's so significant that when Jesus called four fishermen and a ragtag group of others to be his disciples, you see, they were fishermen, they were tradesmen. They had never been called by a rabbi. From age 10, there was this underlying yet pervasive stigma that they did not have what it takes. In their eyes, their purpose was to be a fisherman, a tax collector, a zealot. But when Jesus said, follow me. What the disciples heard for the first time in their lives was you have what it takes and you have a purpose. My purpose. Come follow me. And maybe you need to hear those words today. Maybe that's you today. So, he's calling you. Follow him. If you, if you feel him speaking those words to you right now, if you want to come and pray, the altar will be open. No one will bother you. This is sacred space. Just you and your rabbi. The invitation's open. Will you follow him?